for joining us for another episode of the Vanguard Fitness Hour. Vanguard Exercise Management, a health and wellness firm established for the sole purpose of reducing America's obesity trend. I'm Mario Kuntz, also known as the Fitness Guru, and I'm happy to be here with you once again to share with you the latest and greatest fitness news and wellness information that you can use to optimize and become the best physical version of yourself possible. So I'm going to get right into it because as always, we've got 20 pounds of fitness information, motivation, and inspiration to stuff into a 10-pound bag. So let's get going. All right. So first topic of the day, I'm going to bring our volume down just a little bit. First topic, what's new with the fitness guru? So uh, I wanted to give an update on my intermittent fasting journey. And I started that uh, recently, actually a couple of weeks ago. And I just wanted to give an update on it uh, because I, I really wanted to share what my personal experience was with the uh, actual process of intermittent fasting. And as I reminded you uh, when I started it, the process that because there are different phases of intermittent fasting, the one that I used was a 16-8 method. So basically, all your meals are consumed within eight hour period within an eight hour period. The other 16 hours, you're basically going through a fast. So the method that I used was from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. is when I would actually consume my meals and uh, fast afterwards. So I just wanted to see what the effect was because there's you know quite a bit of talk about uh, utilizing that as a weight loss and weight management strategy. So I wanted to see what was happening uh, with that. My goal was a fairly modest one. I'm very comfortable at you know the weight that I was at, but I wanted to shed a few pounds. So I said I wanted to drop. I was at the time up to 207. And I just wanted to get down to 200 and see what that would be like uh, without making any major changes other than implementing some of the strategies associated with intermittent fasting. I, I hit my six pounds, seven pounds. I actually went a couple pounds below that. So right now I'm at 198 and uh, I feel great with it. Uh, it was, uh, like I said, a modest amount of weight that I wanted to use, but I just wanted to see the effects of it. And it, the biggest change really was getting out of the habit of, of eating late. I had to make some strat, uh, some changes in terms of my schedule because I do keep late hours. Uh, and it's kind of a challenge sometimes getting those meals in with before that eight o'clock cutoff time. So that was something that I, I had to deal with. But other than that, basically, when you think about, well, I'm not eating uh, anything, you know, until 12 o'clock noon, basically it boils down to skipping breakfast. Uh, normally 12 o'clock is the time that I would have lunch anyway. So it's not that difficult. So if that is a strategy that you would like to implement in your own weight loss uh, journey, by all means, I, I find it effective. I really like to promote things that I have direct experience and knowledge of. So I wanted to try that as opposed to just talking about intermittent fasting and what it is and what it does and, and that sort of thing. So uh, I highly recommend it. I thought it was a very effective way uh, to lose some weight in a, a fairly uh, quick, uh, short amount of time. So uh, that is my feedback on that. Some of you are noticing uh, that I've got for the, uh, I'm wearing some different uh, gear on the day. So you see the logo, you see the, uh, the name of the company, Vanguard Exercise Management, you see the hat. These are gifts that were given to me by a very dear friend and former uh, client of mine, Miss Verdell Burns. And I wanna give a, a, a thank you to her for providing this. It was such a surprise getting to my office, seeing the box there with my name on it and uh, opening it up and finding this. So I really appreciate it. Uh, it. Fits great, looks great, really happy about it. So thank you so much, I really appreciate it. And on that, in that vein, uh, I really get spoiled a lot. Uh, so I actually had another gift that a patient of mine dropped off uh, with me when I was uh, treating some uh, of the uh, exercise rehabilitation patients that I see. And uh, Lakitra Cox, I really appreciate this gift. Uh, she knows that I am a coffee drinker. She gave me this uh, Starbucks gift card. And I will definitely be putting this to some good use. So thank you so much for it. Uh, I'm going to try not to get spoiled because it uh, it could very easily happen. Uh, and it just goes to show the uh, the type of folks that I, I work with, really good people. 
and uh, very giving, and uh, they're very appreciative of the things that I do for them, and I'm appreciative of the work that they put in to get to the levels that they're at. So thank you very much, both of you, for those wonderful gifts. I wanted to talk for a moment. I, I do a lot of speaking about stress and its negative effect on the body. I have seen in the, the profession I, I've chosen, I've seen the, the serious and significant effects that stress has on the human body, and it can do some bad things when it gets out of control. One of the things, now, a lot of times we're talking about financial stress or work-related stress or, or family-associated uh, stress. One of the things that I've never really delved into was the effects of relationship-based stress. Now, I, I try to be very transparent about my own situation uh, when it comes to you know being open and honest with my, my audience. And uh, the last relationship that I was resulted in, I was in, resulted in quite a bit of, of stress. Um, I know there is, there's a certain amount of stress that's associated with any relationship, but when it gets to a point where it affects things like your ability to sleep, your ability to just relax and unwind, when you feel like you're walking on eggshells, um, you can notice and you feel a difference in your performance. You're, you're not as sharp anymore. Your physical performance uh, suffers. You know, I wasn't as effective in the gym. I was distracted a lot of times. Uh, and I could feel that, you know, this was having a, taking a toll on me. Stress, if it goes unchecked, can really have debilitating effects. So you make sure, you got to make sure that you're doing everything you can to manage that. Now I know that some levels of stress are are inevitable. You're going to be experiencing stresses uh, in all walks of life, and they come in many different forms. But if you can get control, first of all, you want to identify what are the sources of stress. What's what is it that's causing me to feel this way? Once you have that identified, you want to do whatever you can to manage and minimize and reduce those levels of stress so they don't have those debilitating effects on you. When it comes to relationships, open up, have conversations about what's going on. Uh, you want to make sure that you're sharing your true feelings and hopefully you have a partner that's going to be receptive to those so that you can work through those issues because that stress that comes from that relationship, the thing about it is there's really no escaping it. If you this happens to be a, a spouse, a significant other, someone that you uh, are living with, you know, when you're 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 home, you're basically surrounded by that. you're with that person. So that is something that you definitely want to get a hold of. So do whatever you can to manage that relationship uh, induced stress and work through it just like you would address any other type of stress because it is significant, it is out there, and it is something that you definitely want to be aware of. So just wanted to share that with you uh, and its importance and significance. I also wanted to talk to you about uh, cravings. And I know that you know a lot of times people will say, well, um, you, you, you talk like you know, you're nev never tempted and that you, you know, I know you, uh, you, you're not a fast food uh, eater. I know you don't do sodas and that, that sort of thing. Uh, but I do get cravings just like anyone else. And one of the ones, and I actually want to talk about that in one of uh, the fitness in the news uh, articles. So I'm going to save that. But I want to introduce that topic by stating that, yes, I do have, you know, cravings just like anyone else. Sometimes they're overwhelming. Sometimes I give into them, but I manage the way that I give into them. And I try to use the healthiest means possible. And I'm going to get into that a little later in our show. Okay. Let's move on to the Vanguard commentary. And it comes from, basically, it's uh, it's almost like a, a children's uh, 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 lyric. It's almost like a nursery rhyme, but it really has its roots in health and fitness. And I want to share it with you a little bit. Now, most of it I can remember off the top of my head. I might have to, you know, uh, refer to some notes in that. But it goes uh, a little something like this. And it's called The Six Best Doctors. The Six Best Doctors. The Six Best Doctors Anywhere, and no one can deny it are sunshine, water, rest and air, exercise, and diet. These six will gladly you attend if only you are willing. Your mind they'll ease, your will they'll mend, and charge you not a shilling. So what is that saying? It's not mentioning that one of the six best doctors is a surgeon. It's not mentioning that the six best doctors, one of the six best doctors is someone that treats diabetes or uh, someone that treats brain tumors or, or whatever the case might be. These are all natural sources, sunshine, water, rest, air, exercise, diet, things that we have a lot of control over. So let's break those down one by one. Number one, sunshine. 
So it's recommended that anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes of daily sunlight is essential and a natural way for you to produce the needed vitamin C that you need to have in order to function properly. It doesn't take a lot, just getting outdoors, ex you know, exposing yourself to that sunlight, absorbing some of that to help to build the immune system primarily. Because, I mean, think about what we're going through right now, being in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, although things are starting to open up in that, you don't want to neglect the fact that vitamin D, getting out, getting some sunlight is important. Now, I happen to be in a part of the country uh, where, you know, there's not sunlight, you know, 12 months out of the year. So it's kind of sparing. Uh, I was talking to the, uh, the guest that I'm going to be having coming on later and just talking about how limited we are into our access to, to just natural sunlight just because of our lifestyles. You know, the way that we work, the way that we live, those sorts of things, our transportation needs. So we're, we're a lot of times we're sheltered from that. So what can we do to make sure that we get as much as possible? And again, 10 to 15 minutes, that's not a whole heck of a lot, right? So we want to try to work that into our daily routine. Water. Water. I've done a, a segment on hydration. I've done a couple of uh, seminars on, and workshops on the importance of adequate hydration and drinking water and that sort of thing. So just sticking with the basics. Men, it is recommended that 13 eight ounce glasses of water are consumed a day. So eight, I'm sorry, 13 eight ounce glasses of water. For women, it's nine eight ounce glasses of water. Pregnant women, 10 eight ounce glasses of water per day. Now, when you think about it, that's not really a lot. You just wanna get into the habit of making sure that it's readily accessible, that you're consuming that throughout the day. You don't have to do it all in one sitting, but you want to make sure that you're consuming water on a regular basis. Uh, it's when I talk to people, especially when I'm doing things like fitness assessments and health screenings and that, one of the questions I ask is about the individual's water intake. And it is amazing to me how many people can go through an entire day without consuming even a sip of water. You don't want to be like that. You want to make sure that the body is hydrated properly. Rest is the next one. Adults need to target anywhere between seven to nine hours of sleep per day. What is this going to do? It's going to help to prevent elevated blood, uh, blood pressure levels. It's going to help to decrease stress levels. It's going to help to reduce inflammation, uh, bring down blood sugar levels. Uh, it's going to help to make sure that your immune system is not suppressed. And more recently, I was just reading, uh, well, sorry, reading an article uh, talking about the effects, the negative side effects of sleep deprivation. And this study examined, it was a very wide scale study, and it found that individuals that get less than five hours of sleep per day, by the time that they hit six, the age of 70, they were highly, much more likely to develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So sleep is important for a number of reasons, and this is uh, an ongoing study. In fact, I'm thinking about doing an entire show on the importance of sleep and the effects of the, on the body in terms of what happens when we're not getting allowing ourselves to get that adequate sleep, especially for those of you that train and work out on a regular basis. Recovery is a huge part of your physical development, so you don't want to neglect the basic importance of getting enough sleep. Air is the next one in that uh, the six best doctors. Air, oxygen helps to improve the efficiency of our physiological symptoms. It's going to help to improve metabolism. Uh, and then when you factor in sleep, it helps to reduce certain forms of cancer. So fresh air is another big one. We want to make sure we're, uh, in, a, in addition to getting that sunlight when we're outside, we want to take in that fresh air. So that's a big part of it. Exercise, current recommendations, what are they? So it's anywhere from 150 minutes of moderate exercise um, per week. And, uh, and that's moderate exercise. If it's intense or uh, more uh, targeted, more uh, uh, exercise that's more uh, 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 endurance related and that sort of thing, then the number drops to 75 minutes per week. So if you break that down, it's not that difficult to get that amount of time in terms of exercise each week. So again, What's the best way to eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Just start off small and incrementally start to increase the amount of physical exercise and activity that you're getting per day. You would be amazed at the results and how you're feeling afterwards. So make that a goal. So again, if it's moderate exercise, you know, just you know, brisk walk, uh, light uh, exercise training, if you're, whether it's resistance or uh, you're using machine weights or it's body weight exercises, those sorts of things, 150 minutes a week. If it's intense exercising, I'm talking about, you know, uh, running, uh, training with heavier weights, those sorts of things, 75 minutes. All right. Uh, diet. 
Diets, uh, the best way to emphasize that is to break it down in terms of servings, all right? And we've gone through this, you know, when we we're kids, they talk about, you know, the food pyramid and that sort of thing. So most rec recent recommendation to break down as follows. Uh, five to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables uh, daily. When it comes to organic or lean uh, protein sources, things like fish, chicken, we're looking at two to three servings per day. Cup of beans, okay? In terms of nuts, seeds, legumes, whole grains, we're looking at a cup of those. You wanna avoid processed foods, uh, foods that are uh, high in sugar content, foods that are high in sodium content, especially we're looking out for saturated fats, trans fats, refined sugars, uh, high quantities of red meat, that sort of thing. So that's kind of how our nutri nutritional breakdown should be looking at when it comes to diet. All right. So um, we've covered the six best doctors. So we got sunshine, water, rest and air, exercise and diet. So remember those, I mean, maybe if, even if you don't remember the, the lyrics to the, the nursery rhyme or whatever, just remember the terms and how they fit into your overall fitness regimen in terms of making sure that you're as healthy as possible, you're doing the basics. Again, none of these things, think about the last line of that, uh, that limerick, I guess you would call it, uh, and won't cost you a shilling. None of these cost any money, right? So you can exercise outside for free. You don't have to have any additional uh, fancy equipment. Fresh air, last I checked, there wasn't a charge for that. Extra, uh, I'm sorry, um, diet. When you're talking about cleaning up your diet, actually you're gonna be saving money in a lot of cases because you know if you're not eating out as, as much and you're preparing your food, you're gonna see a cost savings with that. So a lot of benefits to it. Next up, exercise, I'm sorry, our fitness word of the week, the Vanguard fitness word of the week. And what is that week? Uh, that week's word, I've selected the term lactic acid. Now, what is lactic acid? So lactic acid or lactate, it's, it's basically a chemical byproduct of anaerobic respiration. So what does that mean? When we train and we're training hard and that sort of thing, uh, what happens is you know, during normal processes, the body is taking in oxygen and it sends it to our, our muscles, all right? When you're exercising rigorously, the body can't process enough oxygen. So now we're operating on an anaerobic level, which is without oxygen. So the oxygen is not in adequate amounts, isn't getting into the muscle tissue. So what happens? A buildup of lactic acid starts to develop and you get that burn. So you, you've heard, heard the term when you're working out, feel the burn, that sort of thing, right? So what happens is as we're doing that, we're not taking in quite enough oxygen, you're gonna get that burning sensation in the biceps if you're doing curls, in the legs if you're doing squats, uh, in the abdominals if you're doing crunches, that sort of thing. So lactic acid, it's a natural product, a byproduct of exercise. And the way that you're, we're going to manage through that is basically through rest and recovery. Now, lactic acid buildup is not to be confused with DOMS, which is uh, delayed onset muscle soreness. Okay, that usually occurs maybe a day, two days afterwards. So the, the correlation is, is similar, but it's, they're, they're two entirely different processes. So when we're talking about lactic acid, which is, again, that buildup that occurs when we're not taking in quite enough oxygen just because of the intense nature of the exercises that we're participating in, it's, it's something that it's, you know, it's natural. Don't be freaked out about it. The problem is when people feel that burn, a lot of cases, some people relish it. All right, I got a good burn. Other people, you know, this hurts. I don't like this. And they stop their exercise regimen. They quit working out because it's it's uncomfortable. So don't let that be the case. You know, this is a natural byproduct of exercise. So it's not something to be to run away from or be afraid of. It's a natural byproduct of that physical activity or exercise that you're taking place in. So Vanguard Fitness Word of the Week, lactic acid. Couple of articles that I pulled up uh, that I wanted to share with you today. And the first one has to do with what I alluded to during the introduction when I was talking about what's new with the fitness guru, right? So how do I set, satisfy those cravings? Now, I made no uh, a secret about it. And I actually mentioned that, you know, during, I think maybe even during the first episode of this show, which was back in November of last year, um, I am a fan of chocolate. And I have to be able to manage through that, okay, because you can get in a lot of trouble being a fan of chocolate like I am. So what I started doing was looking for alternatives that would both set, that would satisfy that craving and still not get me too far off track of where I want to be in terms of uh, physical uh, shape and performance and weight management and those sorts of things. So what I started doing is utilizing the benefits, and hopefully you can see this on, on camera, of a dark chocolate. 
Okay, now why dark chocolate? Well, dark chocolate has some benefits that your traditional, your Snickers bars, your Hershey's uh, bars, that sort of thing, don't have. So the key ingredient that you want to, that we're talking about is cocoa. And that is the, the foundational uh, ingredient that you find in dark chocolate products. So let me go through some of the benefits that you get when you're consuming dark chocolate. Now, this is just like anything else. You want to eat it in moderation, okay? I'm not saying going out and buy a full case of dark chocolate bars and eat them all in one sitting, okay? This is, again, when you get those cravings, how do you manage through them? And this is the way that I use them for. So I like it because, again, there are health benefits associated with it, and I want to go through some of those with you. Number one, Dark chocolate has been proven to protect your heart. It has benefits that emphasize and stress and improve cardiovascular function. So it has anti-inflammatory process, uh, I'm sorry, uh, properties that help to um, manage through any uh, uh, debilitating effects that you know are on the uh, result of time, uh, the result of any stressors, that sort of thing. It helps to produce, uh, I'm sorry, improve the likelihood that an individual is not getting experiencing blood clots. That's another one. Helps to lower blood pressure. So heart health is you know at the forefront of a lot of individuals' mind, particularly those that are. Uh, into fitness and wellness and diet and health and that sort of thing. So when you're talking about just those those few benefits, I mean, it's worth its weight in, in gold when you're talking about consuming dark chocolate. Helps to reduce the risk of diabetes, okay? There are certain, uh, there's been many studies that show that the consumption of dark, uh, dark chocolate helps to reduce the risk uh, factors associated with insulin resistance, which is a primary cause of diabetes. So it helps to manage through that. Another one, it helps to lower blood pressure. So if you are dealing with uh, high blood pressure and you have those sweet tooth craving, cravings, dark chocolate is a good way to go. Helps to, believe it or not, and this one was uh, kind of a, a shocker to me, it has been shown to improve vision. So individuals that consume one ounces, uh, I'm sorry, one ounce of dark chocolate have shown improved vision after two hours of consumption. So how about that? Now, obviously, I'm a glasses wearer, so maybe I actually need to in increase my uh, uh, intake of dark chocolate as well. But vision improvement, again, that was a surprise to me, but, you know, a pleasant one, uh, nevertheless. Dark chocolate, the nutritional benefits are, are numerous. So it's a great and rich source of fiber. Uh, it's loaded with iron and magnesium and zinc, copper, uh, several other minerals that are beneficial to our overall health. So it's got a lot of benefits in terms of just the overall nutritional value. One ounce serving of dark chocolate. What, is, what does it contain? What's in it? So I'm going to break those down. Calories, one ounce of it, about 170. Protein, you're getting about two grams of that, 12 grams of fat, 13 grams of carbohydrate. So if you're a keto person and that falls within you, because a lot of people are doing keto and they're have to, having to manage their carbohydrate intake over the, the course of their daily uh, routine and that. So that's something you want to be aware of, Make sure that uh, making sure that its consumption doesn't uh, push you over the top and help have you exceeding your limit of allowable carbohydrate intake for the day. Three grams of fiber and seven grams of sugar. OK, so one ounce is more than enough for you to get those benefits that you need. So, again, you're not consuming an entire bar of dark chocolate or, or multiple bars of dark, dark chocolate and that sort of thing. Just enough to satisfy that craving and still allow you to receive the benefits that you get from consuming it. All right. Things that you want to watch out for, because obviously you want to get in the habit. I've talked many times about this. Read your nutritional labels because not all products are created the same, all right? So you want to make sure that the uh, dark chocolate that you select, just like any other product, falls within the range that you are looking for. So you got to get in the habit of flipping that product on the back and looking at those numbers to make sure that they make sense, that they fall in line with what it is that you're looking to accomplish. But overall, dark chocolate is a great source. And again, you want to sat your, it's allowing you to satisfy those cravings because they will come. You just want to manage through them in as healthy a way as possible. All right. So that is our first article of the day. The second one that I wanted to share with you are, is article two, and that is the seven wonders of water. And I talked a little bit about this before when I went through the, uh, the six best doctors. So let's get back into, let's get into water a little bit and its consumption. Seven primary benefits that you're going to get for making sure that your water intake is where it needs to be. And I'm not just talking about it. I like to keep water handy. In fact, 
I've got a bottle right behind me. I'm going to take a sip before I get into this topic. What does water do for you? What can it do for you? When it comes to weight loss, and that seems to be the primary driver behind a lot of individuals embarking on a fitness journey. Uh, when you're, you're talking about starting a fitness regimen and that sort of thing, I want to lose weight. That usually is the most common theme uh, above all other you know, sources, whether it's injury recovery or athletic performance or whatever the case might be. If you're trying to lose weight, Water consumption can help you quite a bit. It's going to help to rev up that metabolism, uh, metabol metabolic system. It's going to help you to feel full. Uh, it's going to, again, keep you hydrated. Um, it, it's going to help you to burn through calories more efficiently. So you got some benefits there. It helps to boost your energy. If you feel drained, you feel depleted, sluggish, you can look for a pick-me-up with water as opposed to a caffeinated beverage, all right? So most people think about, well, I'm, I'm dragging, it's the middle of the day, I'm feeling slow, let me get a Mountain Dew. No, no, no. Water. Just plain old water. Get in the habit of doing that. You'll be amazed at the results. So give it a shot, okay? Avoid the carbonated, sweetened beverages, and choose a healthier route in order to you know, hydrate yourself, get that energy level, get the pick-me-up that you need, particularly in the middle of the day when things are kind of sluggish and, and dragging a little bit. So you might want to think about implementing that into your regimen. You can help to lower your stress levels by consuming water. About 70 to 80% of your brain tissue is made up of water, right? So if you're feeling dehydrated, brain fog starts to set in, your mind and body is starting to feel stressed, okay? Feeling thirsty, a little dehydrated, Fill up, kind of recharge those batteries, use water to help you to do that. So lower those stress levels by consuming water. Help to build your muscle tone, all right? Drinking water is going to do a, several things. It's going to help you to prevent muscle cramping. When I talk to patients and clients and that sort of thing that I work with, and they talk about, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm experiencing a lot of cramping and that sort of thing, particularly in, most commonly I'm hearing it in, in calves. Um, sometimes I'm hearing it in arms, that sort of thing. One of the first questions I ask about is, what's your water intake look like? Next one, I usually ask about potassium levels and that sort of thing. Uh, but water is usually the source. In a lot of those cases, you know, I ask that question, how much water are you taking in? Well, I really don't drink water. Um, does uh, coffee count? No. Doesn't. It? Well, how about um, uh, Kool-Aid or whatever? the case? No, water is water. Okay, so I'm just talking about plain old ordinary water. So you can help to build that muscle tone with it. When you're hydrated, you can exercise longer. You can feel stronger without hitting that wall. So Again, just a basic sip or two of water throughout the day. Just keep yourself replenished, hydrated as you're going through your everyday um, routine. You can help to nourish the skin. I, plenty of people have, you know, you're already familiar with this. When you're drinking more water, it shows up in the skin. Okay, when you're dehydrated, it starts to show up. Your, your skin isn't as clear. You're more apt to, or, or likely to develop acne, uh, those sorts of things. So it's amazing when, you look, amazing when you look at an individual that drinks water on a regular basis as opposed to someone that does not. You're starting to see those fine lines and wrinkles when you're dehydrated. Water is, think of water as nature's beauty cream, okay? Uh, it's going to hydrate your skin cells. It's going to plump, uh, plump them up. It's going to help to make your face look younger, healthier, more vibrant, just another benefit uh, of consuming adequate levels of water. Helps to keep you feeling regular, okay? Along with fiber, water is a very important source for making sure that you're experiencing good digestion, okay? It's going to help to dissolve waste particles and pass them smoothly throughout the digestive tract. So you want to get in the habit of including that, particularly with a meal, okay? A lot of people, you know, when they're sitting down for a meal, you know, it's usually a lot of times it's maybe a soda or maybe an alcoholic beverage or, you know, some people eat, uh, have their meals with coffee or whatever the case might be. Try utilizing water to aid in digestion. It helps to reduce one of the biggest benefits, and I've never experienced it before and never want to experience it, but it helps to reduce the risk of developing kidney stones. So if anyone out there has ever experienced kidney stones before, it ain't fun. Very painful when you're trying to, when you're talking about passing uh, kidney stones. It's going to help to dilute the salts and the minerals that are in, contained in your urine that form these solid crystals. Those solid crystals are known as kidney stones. So it's going to help to break those up and decrease the likelihood that you're going to develop them in the first place. So there's seven quick benefits about the consumption of water. Use it to your advantage. Okay, it's got a lot of benefits to it, and it's very simple to do. 
Again, the key for me anyway is to making sure that it is accessible. When it's around you, you're more likely to, to consume it, right? It's just that, you know, we're so, a lot of times folks are so used to other liquid sources to uh, think that they're, they're getting the hydration levels they, that they actually need and avoiding water. So just go basic water. Keep it handy, making sure that you're consuming that on a regular basis. Next up, the Vanguard Fitness Tip of the Week is portion distortion. That's how I'm actually phrasing it. Portion distortion, what am I talking about? Studies have shown that people or individuals that when they're consuming a meal, eat approximately 43% less food when they utilize smaller portions. So what does that mean? Now, the benefit to that is they still reported feeling uh, satisfied or uh, they reached a level of uh, society. Uh, I'm blocking, losing my word. They're feeling satisfied. They're feeling full when they consume even those smaller portions of food. So if you want to manage through that, some of the strategies that I use, I've used the food scale before. Um, I, have, uh, I eat half of my meals when I'm dining out and I look at it, I play a mental game with myself. So if I'm going out to a restaurant and I'm ordering a meal, I'm going to have half of it. Okay. I don't feel like I'm deprived because I look at the other half as a great lunch for the next day. So I've got something waiting on me that, you know, I'm, I haven't consumed all my meals at my meal and I'm having that at a later time. So I kind of play these <laughs> these uh, these mental uh, gymnastics with myself to help keep my, my yeah, keep me focused when I'm doing that. Avoid buffets. You know, buff I don't even know if buffets are as popular now because of everything that's been going on with the pandemic and that or not. But buffets are just a natural. It's kind of a green light for just eating whatever the heck I want in as many uh, as as great an amount as I want. So you want to do that. I've even used smaller plates. OK, I, again, just the visual of a big old plate makes me think that I got to load it up. Right. So if I'm using a smaller plate, you know, it's not going to take as much to fill it. And after enough time of that, you'll get used to the fact you, you're actually training yourself to eat less. And when you're eating less, you're taking in fewer calories. When you're taking in fewer calories, you don't need as many to burn to burn off as many when you're trying to lose weight or maintain weight. So these are just some things that I use. But again, significant number, 43 percent of respondents to these these studies indicated they consume less food when they eat in smaller portion sizes. So think about that, portion distortion, just making some adjustments in terms of the way that you consume your meals. All right, having said that, I want to bring on a very special guest today. Uh, this gentleman, Dr. Gary D. Tennant, We've known each other for uh, quite a few years. We've worked together on a regular basis. In fact, we, we still work together. And Dr. Tennant is, uh, in addition to many other things, he is a functional medicine, medicine practitioner. So what does that mean? So basically, when we're talking about functional medicine, uh, basically what it is, it's, and, and I'm sure he'll clear this up in case I'm, I happen to be wrong or off target or whatever the case might be. It's a systems-based biology, and it's based on the approach that focuses on identifying and addressing the root causes of illness. All right. So I'm going to bring him on today. He's going to share quite a bit of information for us because I know there's a lot of people that, you know, functional medicine, what the heck is that? So I'm going to bring him on. Happy to have him as a guest. First time on the show. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Gary D. Tennant. All right. Hello, Doc, Mark. how are you? Very nice to meet you. And I am going to, since I have a guest on the show, I'm going to pop on my mask. Because even though the world is starting to open up again, we want to make sure that everyone knows the importance of masking up, staying safe and healthy, still practicing those safety measures in terms of social distancing and washing your hands and continuing to wear your mask. If you have been fully vaccinated, there are, you know, you're starting to see reports come out now about uh, precautions that you don't have to take quite as significantly anymore. Uh, but I still want to make sure that we're promoting the fact that, you know, if you, have, uh, if you haven't, if you're going into areas that are highly congested, you still want to take precautions because it's not just about protecting you, but it's protecting about protecting those around you as well. Both Doc Tennant and I have been vaccinated. Uh, we are both, uh, you know, we've tested negative for, uh, for the, uh, the, the virus. So we're going to remove our mask. We're just doing this as a note to make sure that you continue to utilize safe practices and measures. All right. So Dr. Tennant, welcome to the show. I'm going to grab my 
bottle of water here because we were talking about water intake and that's pretty significant, right? Yeah. So all one, right. One of the great doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it's one of the six. So wanted to start off. The introduction that I gave about functional medicine and what it is at its at its at its root. Uh, was that pretty much on the, the, the money with that? It's identifying the, the, the initial source of the root cause of illness. Is that about accurate for you? Yeah, Mario, uh, that is the main definition of functional medicine. So let me illustrate that a little bit. Please. Let's say you're a patient and you have high blood pressure. All right. Well, there's treatments for high blood pressure, and there's a variety of them. There's the pharmaceutical, which is taking medications. But also another thing that should be approached is why would somebody have high blood pressure? So, and if you can get to that root cause and then either eliminate something that's disturbing the body, or sometimes it's a deficiency, um, sometimes it's one of those great doctors is missing, like exercise or rest um, or water intake. So, if you can identify those, then many times uh, the disease process you can reverse. And I think mm -hmm. functional medicine, one of the unique things about it is that many times we tell patients that they can reverse something that they sure. don't typically hear. Like somebody that has diabetes or blood pressure issues, many times the doctor will just say, well, you have to take this medication. And the patient will say, well, how long do I have to take it? Right. And the answer is usually forever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so it doesn't really fix it. Now it doesn't. Not, not that, it, that I've heard. So no. it, if somebody has to take it on a daily basis, it means that it was never fixed. Now, if you get to the root cause of it, let's say somebody has an issue and they have a deficiency or they're not exercising, or they're overweight. Now, if you fix that, many times that'll permanently fix the blood pressure issue. Okay. So that's a whole different approach of trying to find it. And I think that you will see in your health history, and probably with the audience too, how often do doctors explore those those other things that are important, like diet? Have you ever had a doctor talk to you about diet? Honestly, I have not. And I, I was thinking about when I was you know, writing out the uh, you know, the, the lines to the, the six best doctors. Right. I've, I've yet to have a doctor talk about that with me. Any of them? None. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason why we don't have permanent solutions is because those things need to be addressed. So you mentioned some that are good, and we go through this with people with functional medicine. We do assessments, for example, on their stress levels. Now, you mentioned that. Yes. For example, on their uh, sleep. We do food diaries on people. We ask them about things like exercise. So all of those things are important because those are foundational. So those are pillars of having somebody improve their health and getting back to a non-disease state. So we also make that distinction, okay. is that we're not just looking to see if somebody has the disease or not. We want to optimize health. And if right. Now, those are some of them. There's others, too. When we do blood work and we do other assessments where we find that there's something going on that should not be going on with that particular body, and we can try to identify that and improve it. Gotcha. That is a, a good description because uh, I think there's a lot of either uh, misconceptions about what functional medicine is, or there are just people that, you know, folks out there that just have no idea that it even exists. I mean, when you think about, uh, you know, uh, seeing a physician, it was that traditional view of it. So I, I appreciate that breakdown of it. Now, you, Dr. Tennant, wear a couple of hats. And I know this because we work together on a regular basis in that. Not only are you a, a renowned and highly skilled chiropractor, you're also a functional medicine practitioner. Is that the proper title for it? Yes. Uh, functional medicine practitioner? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, can you explain how those two methods of treating patients come together or work together to... Uh, to promote healthy living? Yes. Well, chiropractors, for the most part, um, unless they're functional medicine practitioners also, we work with more things with the musculoskeletal system, especially with the spine, athletic injuries. So it's more, there's 11 body systems, musculoskeletal being one, and nervous system, which we as chiropractors work on. Functional yeah. medicine takes it as another step, more in the dietary approach, those stressors in life like sleep and uh, we do more blood work when we do uh, the functional medicine part of things. Okay. But I'll tell you the one thing that we don't do now, uh, uh, neither the chiropractic doctor nor the functional medicine doctor, is we don't promote uh, medicines or pharmaceuticals. Gotcha. And in fact, we say the least amount of drugs is, is the best. Wow. So one of our stated goals when we sit down with somebody is if you came in to me, and this happens all the time, um, where patients come in and they're on a list of medications, 
Now, um, it's not uncommon. I'm 63 years old. The average 50-year-old is on five different prescriptions. So that's the average wow. one. Now, I've seen them up to 30. 30? 30 prescriptions, right? Okay, but our stated goal is when we work with somebody to um, the least amount of drugs is the best. So, for example, I had one patient and uh, she had lupus and she went from seven meds down to zero. So that's one of our stated goals when we start is to try to identify and try to get somebody off of meds. And part of that is because um, you mentioned my hats. I was a registered nurse before being a chiropractor. Uh -huh. Is that uh, all meds have side effects. And so when somebody's on 10 different medications, um, it's really easy for a med to have five side effects. So they potentially could have 50 side effects from those medications. So are we talking about contraindications? We're just talking that somebody starts taking like a cholesterol med. Or, okay. Gotcha. Okay. So somebody doesn't eat right and they don't exercise and they're not sleeping well. So right. those are three factors that can make cholesterol go up. Okay. Genetics and some others too. Well, let's say somebody has a high cholesterol level. So if they start taking a statin drug, uh, there's a study that shows that they end up on five other medications for the side effects. So the name of the article was uh, statins are a gateway drug to other medications. Now, I'm 63 years old, I am on zero medications, and we've been able to do that with patients, get them down to the least amount possible, and that's totally different than I think the, I call it the AMA approach, the pharmaceutical approach, where they seem to be happy having people on multiple, multiple, multiple uh, medications. And sometimes one is for the side effects of the, of other, the other, like yeah. the statin. Yeah, gotcha. And just for the audience, now, a statin is a drug that's utilized to reduce cholesterol levels. Is that correct? That is correct. Absolutely. Okay. Um, that's a good uh, comparison. I, I was really curious to know that. Um, when we're talking about functional medicine, now, I'm also aware of something called integrative medicine. So are the two similar? Are they dissimilar? Do they work together? What's the, now, from what I, the, the extent of what I'm familiar with, integrative medicine takes a look at the lifestyle habits of the individual and takes that into account when treating a patient. Is that accurate or what, what's your take on that? I would say the two are mostly some, similar. Okay. There's some little distinct differences. An integrated medical practitioner usually means they integrate different methods. Okay. So for example, a, a, an MD could be an integrated doctor and they have a stress management person on the team and an exercise physiologist and a nutrition person and an acupuncturist. There would be an integrated team because they, they use different approaches. Gotcha. Now, an integrated doctor, too, and functional medicine does a lot of that, too. You'll see that there's teamwork because a functional medicine doctor maybe doesn't do as much what you do. They appreciate the rehab and the exercise, but maybe that's not their specialty, so they'll work with somebody or an acupuncturist. So maybe the functional medicine doctor is not an acupuncturist or can work with somebody that does uh, body work like uh, massage therapists or yoga practitioners. So, but mostly those two are, um, they're overlapping. Now I have seen, uh, probably MDs use the term integrated medical practitioner because they put other people on the team. And gotcha. that, that I think is usually a beneficial approach. Okay, gotcha. So when we're talking about teams, what type of individual make up the team that you uh, kind of spirit? Okay, well, there would always have to be somebody, either the practitioner themselves or someone else on the team that specializes in nutrition. Okay. So you put it as, nutrition. as diet, but nutrition, sure. targeted nutrition, looking at food intakes, um, avoiding certain foods, uh, teaching people the proper way to eat. And I'll tell you this, I was a registered nurse, and just let me ask you this, if you go into most hospitals, that is run by registered dietitians. Do you think that food is good for people? I would tend to doubt it. I mean, I spent some time in hospitals visiting some folks, and between the foods that I see in the cafeteria and even the vending area, I mean, it's, I always found it ironic that I'm in a hospital, but I can go to the vending area and buy chips, soda, candy bar. Just that's the name that's true. That is true. So those are some people that are running that nutritional part. So usually in the integrated medicine or functional medicine, it's somebody who's trained in functional medicine type nutrition. Okay. So that's the things that, like you said in the, uh, before I came on. Gotcha. So the fruits, the vegetables, looking at high levels of fiber, looking at supplements that are specific for patients. Okay, gotcha. Now, here's the big one. Now we talked about integrative medicine. 
how does functional medicine differ from traditional or conventional medicine? Okay, well, it's a little bit night and day, so let me tell you the difference. So, um, tell me if I'm mostly on target with this. Okay. When you go to a medical doctor, for the most part, you go in, you describe your symptoms, yeah. they think of a medication, they write a prescription, they submit it to the insurance company with a diagnosis code, and that's the end of that uh, journey, except you take the meds for the rest of your life. Yeah, sounds about right. That's about it, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's never that. So what we do is we get in and we look at things like, now you mentioned stress. Now stress does have the emotional component, relationships and finances, but it, and, but it has sleep, it has yeah. blood sugar levels, yeah. it has uh, structural stress. Um, so there's many things, and, and you are right because the stress response is a little bit different in everybody, but it, it creates a response in the body that is generally unfavorable over long periods of time. Sure. So we're meant to have a stress response, and that's good for us. Um, it's often talked about fight or flight. Flight. Yeah, mm -hmm. where your heart rate goes up and your blood pressure goes up. So that's okay when you're in need of that, when you're fighting a tiger. It's, uh, <laughs> always. But uh, you don't need that when you go home and you're just talking to your spouse and you're arguing about it, or you're, ha or you're having a bad day at work and you're having a bad hair day and politics sets you off and you're not exercising, your blood sugar is spiking and you're not sleeping. Recipe for disaster. Yeah, all of those are stress uh, components. So in functional medicine, we try to identify those because we know the long-term effects of those are detrimental to someone's health. So we try to identify those. Just like we try to identify things in our car, I don't wait until I'm on the side of the road with my hood up and steam coming out of my car. If I hear something a little off on my car, I want to fix it. Or if a light goes on, I want to you know, put some air in the tires. I don't wait until the thing is wobbling and falling off on the highway. Right. But that's a little bit the way our health system works, is that we wait until there's a disease process. Um, I had one patient uh, that her whole family is diabetic, and so her whole plan was just to go in once every three months to see if she's diabetic now. And that's basically it. That was it. That was her entire plan. And last I knew, she had eaten a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts and didn't feel good. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, uh, you have a certain responsibility to your own health because what we should do as patients is we hire people. And, but we're, we're in charge of it. We're in charge of our own health. So you're in charge of your health. I'm in charge of mine. Yes. And your job is to hire the right people. Now, the right people would be a good team. Now, medical doctors are necessary, obviously. Sure. Sometimes you get an arrow through the head. I mean, you don't need to talk to a nutritionist <laughs> or a yoga person. You need to have an arrow surgeon that knows how to take that out of your head. Or, or sometimes when it's a short a, a crisis, like an antibiotic is necessary for strep throat or something like that. Infection. That sort of thing. Sure. Right. And then other times when things get more serious. But let me lay out a, uh, a health program that I think is the best. So okay. I, I think 90% of your time, energy, and money should be on prevention. If you're, if you're listening or watching right now, get some notes together, okay? Because this is, these are some, some nuggets that are, are like gold. So can you repeat that again? Sure. 90% of your time, energy, and money should be on prevention. So think about that, like, say cancer, like yes. heart disease. Would you rather have a heart attack and then figure out what to do, or would you rather prevent it? Prevention, all day long. All day long, right. Now, if it becomes an issue, then you have to go that direction, but if you can prevent it. But what is the prevention? Prevention are these pillars over and over again. It's proper diet. It's sleeping. It's stress management. It's... Um, the exercise portion sure. and vitamin D levels, like getting the proper sun and, yeah. and yeah. the others that you mentioned before. So those are a good start on it. So 90% of time, energy, and money should be on prevention. And then a continuum of health choices, then uh, practitioners that are natural. And what I mean by that is that uh, they're safe. So the safest uh, types of practitioners are exercise is safe, and yoga, and chiropractic, and acupuncture, and physical therapy, and there's others too but you get the point, um, they're safe. Because the next level is medication. Yeah. Now, now medications can't be called safe because all of them have the potential side effect of death. Yeah, and you know, that's, that's very interesting you mentioned that. Um, and I know it's been talked about ad nauseum, but 
every time you see a, a, a commercial ad for prescription medication, <laughs> there's always the, you know, the disclaimer at the end that runs through you know, all the side effects. In fact, I, so much so that I was, I was uh, driven to record uh, a commercial for it. And I can't remember what it was. I'm gonna, actually going to do a, a show on it and we'll probably use it as a seminar topic. But the list of side effects were so extensive and, and so glaring that I, I just I was compelled to do that, but it's amazing um, the amount of side effects that were. The I'd rather have the initial uh, ailment right that it was for, and it was some for something that really wasn't all that significant. Right, but where, where, you know, one of the side effects was was death. With death, leakage, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. elevated blood pressure was another one. Yeah, the, uh, blurred vision. You know, just all yeah. these. This is a, a whole pr 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 stuff. prone to infections, right? Yeah. Um, there is one medication for restless leg syndrome, and they said that uh, a couple of the potential side effects are gambling and promiscuity. And I wow! Just, I just wanted, I just wanted to see, you know, some of you, honey. I swear it wasn't, it wasn't me. me. It, it was the meds. <laughs> we owe ten thousand dollars, and here's my new girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> but you oh, know what doesn't have side effects? What's that? Except good is proper diet. Proper diet. Okay. okay. So yeah. that that's all good for you. Uh, exercise and healthy lifestyles. So they, they do have some good side effects. Like you feel better. You're more energetic. Absolutely. You live longer. You you yeah. look better. I, I I swear by it. Yeah. And uh, I I I feel like I'm a um, I try to be a living, walking, breathing testimony to that. Um, and when you compare someone that takes care of themselves. Versus someone that, you know, a similar age that really has just not made health a priority. The just the visuals are astounding. Right. And and their functionality. Oh, yeah. So there's a fair amount of people and it's unfortunate because they're giving up their life. Um, like somebody that has blood sugar issues and blood pressure and cholesterol issues because of their lifestyle choices. But they're many of them hardly get through life. Yeah. They they work and they go home and they're fatigued all the time and yeah. their relationships suffer and they can't walk with their kids or grandchildren or do anything that's meaningful that they want to do. Absolutely. So um, I often use the phrase choice, not chance, determines your destiny. Choice, not, not chance, determines your destiny. Right. So with, with your health, like with your health, that's like 95 percent of it's that. It's, it's pretty rare that somebody's just going down the street and a tree falls on their head. It's possible, but most likely it's that you're eating a Snickers bar or uh, drinking some Coke or mm -hmm. not exercising or some of the other things. So based off of what you were you were saying about, you know, the, the scripts and the lack of um, uh, mentioning of any of the six best doctors when you go and see your, your primary care physician, that sort of thing, um, and the, just the, the cost of medications and that sort of thing, is, 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 is the healthcare industry broken? It's absolutely broken. And let me just give you one statistic. So um, there's industrialized nations in the world, and we are number two from the bottom. From the bottom. So we're not the bottom yet. We're second. In terms of? Health uh, profiles. Wow. Okay, so we're doing something definitely wrong. We also have the most uh, costs of, in healthcare. We have the most costs, and we take the most amount of drugs. So those two things. We're the costliest, we take the most amount of drugs, and we're second from the bottom. So if you think of other societies, they don't do things the way we do. They don't run to the doctors. There's not a Walgreens on every corner. They have natural methods. They take care of themselves. They eat more naturally. They're more active. So they have a whole set of things that are way different than what we do. So, and you look at it um, as far as health costs, as far as insurance costs, sure. as far as Medicare costs, and you see they're going through the roof for the simple reason is we're becoming less healthy. So we haven't turned that around. So when people talk about those things, they should really slap somebody inside the head and say, well, what should we do to actually get healthier? Let's not just talk about paying for this because you can pay for diabetes and you can pay for kidney uh, dialysis or you can prevent it yeah. with, with certain lifestyle choices. Absolutely. But there's not that much talk about that and there's no. not, much, not much talk about responsibility. But... Um, in Star Wars, there was this scene where um, this hologram comes and says, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you are our last hope. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, very, I, that's the very first one. That's what I think. <laughs> There's certain practitioners. They are our last hope. 
for good health and saving this nation. Because what we're doing right now is going to bankrupt our nation. And it also bankrupts people's lives, too. So when they're sick all the time and they're in the hospital and they take 10 prescriptions and there's these side effects and they have gambling issues and promiscuity and <laughs> leakage and all, all these other things, I mean, that's wasted human potential, too. It really is. Yeah, so uh, we don't want to be in that. So, but there's only one... One way to do that is for people to take responsibility and then assemble a healthcare team that is in alignment with what their goals are. Now, if someone's alignment is just to take a bunch of meds, well, there's plenty of ways to go about that. Yes, and you see are. the commercials there, you know, every five commercials is on a drug, and doctors will write scripts left and right, and you go to the urgent care, and that's a lifestyle too. Wow. It, it's interesting that you mentioned um, you know, getting those, those scripts from your, your doctor, your primary care physician, whatever the case might be, and you take them into, uh, you know, a CVS or Walgreens, and uh, you just kind of look, you, you gave a real interesting analogy or a story that you shared with me when you were talking about, um, the, you know, the, the slogan or the motto of, of the Walgreens. And yeah, that, well, and what, what's the motto of Walgreens? If I, if I remember correct, Walgreens was something like at the, Corner of healthy and happy, or That's happy it. and healthy, yeah. something like that. Corner of happy and healthy. Okay. Walgreens okay. at the corner of happy and healthy. Okay. Yeah. So I went in the other day. All right. So I saw a multitude of soft drinks. Yeah, you can buy sodas from. Forty-seven Walgreens. of them, different ones, <laughs> including Gatorade. Okay, so Coke, <laughs> Diet Coke, Fanta. You got the whole shebang. I saw a variety of candies. Yeah. Couldn't even count them. There's too many of them. Plenty of cigarettes. I saw an assortment of whiskeys, and I also saw ho hos. Yeah. Now, Mario, which which <laughs> corner is which corner is that? <laughs> well, it doesn't sound like it's the the healthy corner. Maybe it makes some people happy to be eating that kind of stuff or drinking those kinds of beverages and that. But I don't see where you get that. You arrive at that uh, wellness intersection at uh, with the streets that they're mentioning in that slogan. Well, I just wonder how many people are purchasing those things and go to the back for a prescription to counter those for their blood sugar. Wow, it's not, you put it like that, they got a nice little racket going. Yeah, yeah. You you, you make them so they can't breathe, and then they drink some whiskey and, and some soft drinks and some candy, and their <laughs> blood sugar is off, so they go to the back and take a blood pressure med. And then then we'll take a couple others for the side effects. Yeah, I mean, you call it a racket. I mean, they're doing some funny things there over at Walgreens. So um, they came, when I checked out one time, they asked if I wanted to donate a dollar to the Heart Association. I said, no, but I want you to stop selling cigarettes. <laughs> what kind of reaction did you get? Well, it was a clerk. It's not their fault. They just kind of looked at me and they're like, please, sir. I'm, I'm like, I know, I know it's not you, but Walgreens, quit selling cigarettes. If you have any integrity as far as health, quit selling cigarettes. You know how bad they are. That's a good point. They're not sending me a Christmas card again this year. Probably not. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> you going to be all right with that? <laughs> they, yeah. They stopped a long time ago. So um, what does the idea, what is the profile of an ideal functional medicine patient look like? I mean, who, what type of individual should be seeking the, uh, the care of a functional medical practitioner? Okay, well, the types of patients that I see are mostly these. Um, a lot of uh, digestive disorders. Okay. A lot of autoimmune issues, so there's things like lupus, lupus. And, and fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis, and um, also a lot of hormone disorders, uh, like thyroid uh, disorders, like low thyroid, okay. um, and other hormone disorders. Uh, the autoimmune issue is like, very, very profound. Um, there's something like 169 autoimmune issues identified now. Um, so, and I'm 63 years old, and I don't remember as a youngster, I don't remember people having autoimmune issues, but now I see people with three and five of them. So they might have a Hashimoto's thyroid issue, and then irritable bowel syndrome, and then rheumatoid arthritis. So we're doing something wrong to setting our immune system off, so it's attacking our cells. Mm. Um, but... Um, so those are the types of patients that generally seek a functional medicine practitioner okay. because they're trying to get away from uh, taking so many meds. Yeah. And so they, but they just realize that each time they go to the doctor or if they even get a referral, it's still kind of the same thing over and over again. So they end up with bunches of meds. Got it. So in your opinion, what is the biggest mistake 
that individuals make when it comes to managing their own health. I mean, I've got my 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 concepts and beliefs on that, but what are yours? What do you think some of those are? Okay. Those? Well, if I had to pick like five or six, one would be drinking soft drinks. Um, okay. So uh, there was a study so, that showed if somebody drinks just one soft drink a day, they double their chance of diabetes. So one a day. One a day. So there's like a, a, this. This is really significant to me. Um, when you say a soft drink, what, are you talking about a, a can? Yeah. So like twelve so, ounces. 12 ounces. Of, do you know I know people that can go through a liter of Pepsi in a day? I do. And I know that. I'm the, sorry, a two liter. Okay. You know, the, the, okay. the big bottles. Yeah. I do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And they have big golf over at the 7 Eleven. It's those, basically a bucket. Yeah. yeah. Those things Those things are pretty big, too. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, drinking soft drinks is one. Obviously, smoking cigarettes, which we've known that now for a while. Okay. Um, the AMA used to promote cigarettes, by the way. Um, and they said uh, nine out of ten doctors that smoke recommend camels, uh, by the way. That's right. There used to be old commercials <laughs> about those. They're, they're dead. Yeah, yeah. They're dead. You, can, you can actually YouTube those. Uh, uh, cigarette commercials featuring doctors or uh, cigarette ads. You'll see a lot of them. I saw one with uh, uh, Fred Flintstone. He yeah. was smoking uh, Winston. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's His old commercial. black and white commercial. You can find it out there. It's out there. Okay, so another is taking too many meds. Okay. So... Medications, you might think that it's healthy for you. It's not. Uh, every single drug has a side effect. And I've known at least three or four patients where um, they lost kidney function because of the meds that they took. And it was a pretty simple one, Advil-type drugs um, that knocked their kidneys out. So if somebody, let's say somebody has arthritis or headaches and they take you know, four a day for a couple of years, that has a potential to kill the kidneys. Mm -hmm. And then they, they end up either having to have a kidney transplant or on dialysis. We're talking about like NAIDS, NAID. Yes. Yeah. So Advil, any ibuprofen, or another fun statistic is about fifteen thousand people die per year from those medications. From medications that Advil, ibuprofen. Wow. Just that one. Fifteen thousand. Just that. So it's like uh, I use Advil because that's the big one, but it's to, yeah. it's a leave and all the other ibuprofen, Motrin, and Motrin. Yeah, that whole that whole category. But uh, so let's. Think of a plane that has 40 people on it that says Advil on the side and it crashes every day. Are you getting on that plane tomorrow? Absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but for people to say, hey, I can just keep taking this med and it's reasonably safe. And I'm not saying, you know, like, if somebody takes an Advil, you know, once every month or two because they just have their head hurts or something. That's, yeah. that's not it. But, like, the long-term effect of these medications is profound. Um, and, it, and it causes toxicity in the body. And... One of the reasons this is like slightly funny, except that it's sad, is that they test your kidneys and they test your liver before you go on medications because they know that they knock them out. Wow. They want to make sure they're strong enough to withstand the assault that they're going to be coming their way. Medication. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> it, it, you're right. It is sad when you think about that. Um, so, are there methods that of functional medicine that are out there? that you know, folks may not even be aware exist. Sure, um, I've mentioned it, but detoxification is hugely important. Okay. I'll give you a stat that uh, I calculated. Um, so every cell in the body detoxifies 10,000 times a day. So if you do the math, our body detoxifies 10 quadrillion times every day. Wow. So if we block the detoxification methods in our body, our body becomes um, toxic. toxic. And the toxin is another way to say poison. And we have poisons in our in our lives in these manners. We have fumes from the carpet, and we have stuff on the wood, and we have paint fumes, and we have cigarette smoke, and we have smog, and we have medications, and we have alcohol, and we have lots of things, like probably 10 or 100,000 that are assaulting us. Yeah, we got a, it's, there, there's a crew outside of the building that we're at right now, and they're uh, redoing the uh, parking lot, and they're using tar, and they're, they're painting out there. And right, so we're we're getting some of those, but our body's pretty good if the detoxification methods are there to get rid of those. Okay. And even with medications, you know, you take them every day because the body says, this is a toxin, I need to get rid of it. So it it, it puts it into a different form and pushes it out the kidney or, or out the liver, okay. so that your level drops, so the next day you have to take it again. Because otherwise, if it didn't do that, the med would continue to work. But the body sees it as foreign. It's not natural. And so 
Um, one of the methods we use is to help people with their detoxification methods, and it mostly goes down to their digestive tract. So you, you talked about digestion and, and proper bowels. Uh, those things are important because that's one of the four methods. Kidneys is another method. Okay. Uh, breathing and skin are, th th there's only four ways that toxins come out of our body. Right? Sure. It's those four ways. And the last two are not the major ones. So we work on things like the detoxification of the digestion. So we look at um, that and we assess that from a standpoint because there's so many things that start in the digestive tract. I mentioned autoimmune issues, but yes. the majority of them start in the digestive tract. Okay. So the body becomes inflamed. There's something that's been eating or what's called leaky gut, and it sets off the immune system, and then it either attacks the thyroid or the joints for um, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or any, somewhere else in the body. Um, so detoxification methods are um, important for us. And then also just the way that we analyze things like lab work. Uh, so we look at uh, proper ways of looking at lab work, help us identify nutritional status, either deficiencies or excess. Like you said, with vitamin D, um, we wore our masks here for COVID, but uh, there's studies out there that show that people whose vitamin D levels were adequate rarely got COVID, or if they did, it was very, very mild. Wow. And you actually see that as a first-line treatment when somebody goes into a hospital, if they assess their vitamin D levels. And then they bump it up, you know, with some some sort of method of supplementation. We should have been doing that anyways. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so when the COVID broke out, we should have our uh, levels tested or just take vitamin D. But so those are things that we want to identify. And we'd rather identify them early and do some fine tuning. So you asked me about patients coming in. I do have some patients that, are, that come in and they're healthy and they're like, I want to stay this way. So, uh, so let's catch it. If my vitamin, let's do some blood work. You know, if we can catch it. We yeah. need. I need a little more zinc or vitamin D or something before it becomes a disease process. Right. And so yeah. that ninety percent of your time, energy, and money should be on prevention and be applied to functional medicine as well. And then also, um, I think that we work with uh, other practitioners. Like I'm very uh, uh, appreciative of people that do things like yoga, teach yoga, or Pilates. And, sure. And as you know, I refer you patients to do the rehab part Absolutely. and the ex exercise part and the nutrition part. Yeah. So all of us as a team, I think that that's unique to functional medicine, as opposed to mo most medical doctors don't do that. Most medical doctors don't work with the exercise person, right? I, I've never encountered one. Yeah. They've been exposed to one directly. They, they, in my experience, they kind of give generic uh, uh, advice. They'll say, like, drop a few pounds or... I've heard that. You know, try, 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 to, ex try to exercise a little more. Yeah. Okay, but that's not that, that's not specific. And it's yeah. not, You're not getting so, a detailed plan. At least not that I've, I've seen. Well, You're who, not getting a detailed who plan. Who doesn't know that? that? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. It's very okay. common knowledge. But somebody would take the bull by the horns and say, hey, let's put together a program. So I think that the best patients would be ones that have an active plan and doing that and working with people that have stated goal. So I think you're in alignment with that stated goal, at least amount of meds and, you know, try to get people Absolutely. to do healthy lifestyles, and Absolutely. identify things before they're an issue. So that's the type of functional medicine uh, patient that is ideal. Got it. And I, I, I hope you, you, you guys out there um, heard that one line about, you know, you have a patient that comes in and you know, just, uh, you know, a healthy person and they're there because they want to stay that way. And a lot of times, if you mention the fact that, well, uh, you know, I'm on my way to the doctor, I got a doctor's appointment. One of the most common reactions you'll usually get is, what's wrong? You're sick. And it just doesn't, you know, we don't, we, we, we need to sometimes change our, our focus when it comes to taking care of ourselves. You know, let, let's not wait until something is wrong. Let's, you know, get ourselves healthy and then do what it takes to remain there. So that kind of leads me to the next question I want to ask you about. Uh, and you've talked a lot about, you know, what you do and how you work with patients and that sort of thing. Do you have, uh, is there a success story that you can mention that you can uh, think of to share with the audience? You know, someone that you've worked with and, um, you know, that you're very proud of the outcome and proud of their performance and what they've been able to do, anything like that? Yes. Well, uh, functional medicine, generally, we say we help people with 80 to 90 percent of the time. So as long as we can catch it before it's too late, yeah. then we're usually successful. So I'll give you an, an example. Now, there, there's many. I've been in practice over 35 years, but I'll just pick one or two. Um, so I had a patient. She said she was scheduled to have her thyroid removed. Um, so there's a actually a protocol for somebody whose thyroid is too active. 
And so I said, well, let's give it a little bit of time. So we worked on it um, for 90 days and then we redid lab work and the lab work came back pristine, absolutely perfect. So I sent her back to the endocrinologist who was scheduled to do the uh, surgery to remove the thyroid. Said, well, you know, these lab results are perfect, so you don't need your thyroid removed anymore. Wow. Now, there's an interesting thing about that story. Is so the patient said, so, doctor, endocrinologist, are you going to send anybody over to the functional medicine doctor who is supposed to have their thyroid removed? He said, the endocrinologist said, no, I'm not. Anne said, by the way, we never had this conversation. Wow. In, in my experience, it's always been about, in, in most cases, when you, you see something that's problematic, uh, it's kind of like a follow the money kind of a pattern. I'm not surprised at that reaction because you basically took money out of that person's pocket. When they perform that, that thyroid removal surgery, uh, there's the cash register is ringing. That patient no longer needs it because of the care that you provided. So... Yeah, I, I, I get it. Well, let me, let me tell you a story. There's a cardiologist that decided to do more prevention. So he started working with his patients on prevention, and lo and behold, they didn't have to do so many tests. Yeah. And guess what happened to that doctor? Please don't tell me they got rid of him they or did. her. They got rid of him. Wow. Wow. So they kicked him out of practice. Because if you do a cardiac catheterization, maybe it's $10,000 or $20,000, but... Uh, the, the money, money, money. The fees, the fees generated from a consult on these things that we're talking about. Yeah. Let's say they're three hundred or whatever. Okay. Five hundred, but it's not the same as twenty thousand to do the. So they didn't yeah. mind the patients not not doing well and exploring it and doing all these uh, tests. Um, that seemed to be what the bottom line of that story is. That's uh, that really drives home the fact the the, the point. Um, of what I've, I've, I've seen, I can't remember when I initially saw it, but it was um, almost like a, a, a cartoon kind of depiction of a, a physician standing in front of a class training all these younger physicians. And he had written on the board, every patient cured is a customer lost. <laughs> and that kind of ties into what you were sharing with me just now. So uh, it, it's sad, but it's true, but uh, really an indication of the fact that we really need to take more of an aggressive role in managing our own our own care, and I, I would think that the healthcare industry in itself needs to take a, a good look at itself and really make a determination as to what business are you really in. We know what business they're in. Hmm. They're running the show right now, which puts us second from the bottom. From the bottom, right? And healthcare costs through the roof, and people's health profiles bad. And people not feeling well and not having energy and digestion not working well and having too much stress yeah. and they're you know it goes it goes on and on it does just ask a handful of people around you how how they feel yeah. um, how their exercise level is you know what program are they working on to improve their health yes. you know I, most of them their health program is i like, take this red pill at nine o'clock and yeah. this blue one at 10 and this green one at 11 and they go through the day and that's their health plan yeah and that is in and of itself sad. So, wow. Uh, well, Doc, in closing, um, I want to say that this has been fantastic. I really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, I got to ask you, if there is someone out there that's looking to get find out more information about, um, you know, the, the, the treatment options that you provide, the care that you offer, uh, maybe they just got some general questions in that. How can folks get in touch with you? Well, I can do some consults through Zoom now. You know, when we do blood Good. work and like that, I can order lab work and work with people. I, I prefer to do it, you know, face to face because I'm an old practitioner, you know, <laughs> uh, 35 years. But um, they could call uh, our office at 708-481-1715. And then I could work with them uh, as far as uh, over the phone or refer them to somebody uh, to get some help. But uh, some other things that we can do too, and you know, I want to offer this to you. You know, there's some of these assessments that are helpful for people to take a look at uh, the nutritional assessment. Sure. Uh, we do it both through questionnaire. Um, we have one questionnaire that's 321 questions, but helps us identify nutrition, uh, nutritional needs, and it's way better than you know most people's plan is. You know, if they talk to their medical doctor, 
I had a medical doctor at a party pull me aside and said, hey, doc, um, they don't teach us much about nutrition in medical school. And I elbowed him and I said, don't worry, everybody knows you don't know much about nutrition. <laughs> okay, but so that should not be the person that you get nutritional advice from. It also shouldn't be from the magazines checking out at the grocery store. And it probably shouldn't be from the person at the gas station that you're asking about the supplement. Right. So there's ways to do it that are specific with blood work. There's ways to do it with 321 questions that get to the bottom of it. So those are a couple of things that uh, we can offer people. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, I'd, it'd be nice to have you come back and maybe do a recap and maybe talk about a, a couple other topics or two. And uh, I'm sure the audience got some great information out of today's uh, interview. So I really appreciate it. I've, I've been looking forward to this one for quite a while. So I'm really glad that you took the time to come on and, and share that. Uh, with the viewers and listeners. So thank you very much, Doc. All right. Really appreciate it. All right. So that is the uh, wrap-up of our show for today. So as always, uh, remember the Vanguard motto, and that is to train hard, eat clean, and stay focused. So until next time, I'm Mario Kuntz. Again, special guest, Dr. Gary D. Tennant, signing off for this episode. Next week's episode is going to be on Friday, May 21st. And uh, the topic is choosing the right personal trainer. So that is going to be the subject show topic for that uh, for next week. So make sure that you're back. We're looking forward to seeing you at that time. And in the next yeah. and in the interim, uh, make sure you stay healthy and we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you so much. Take care and be safe.